Hello everyone, this is going to start out ch chapter 12 and this is where we're going to start looking at DNA. This is a very good chapter because we're learning about just your genetics a little bit more in depth. Um, but basically this chapter is going to continue our understanding of how genetics play an important role in producing our phenotypes. So with that being said, let's get into it. Now, I start out this chapter with a lot of slides that you don't have to take down. Um, over the years, I've changed how I've taught this part of the class, you know, before I actually had kids do case studies, you know, uh, I had them actually try to memorize these um, experiments from the early 1900s. And honestly, looking back, I, I care more about your understanding of the actual science behind what's going on, like the DNA and replication. This stuff is just the history of it. So um, basically what I would like to start with is this page is from the, I forget what year it's from. I want to say it's from like the early um, 1900s, uh, but base, this is a genetics textbook. DNA is only mentioned on one page here. They don't know much about DNA. Um, they're like, yeah, it probably has something to do, but we just don't know what it is. Uh, this is the only page in this genetics textbook that DNA is, is uh, mentioned. So you can, you can see how far our understanding of genetics has come over the years. So in 1869, uh, we first discovered what DNA is or that DNA or cells have DNA. Um, this is Friedrich Meischer. Uh, he extracted white blood cells and he liced the cells, means he broke them apart. And he found out that they had something in them. He called them nuclein. Now we call them obviously DNA, but we're obviously finding out something is in the cell that is there and we just don't know what it is. <laughs> Uh, Phoebus Levine, I think that's how you pronounce his name, he determined that the DNA has um, a nucleotide structure of a base sugar and phosphate group. This is about, you know, 50 years later, 40, 50 years later. Uh, he recognizes the, uh, I'm sorry, he identifies the, like the components of DNA, but he wrongly tries to comprise them like this. And it just, you can see it's not what DNA looks like, but um, we're on our way to understanding the structure of DNA. Uh, along came, uh, or comes the uh, Griffith experiment. This is where uh, we're going to look at some mice. So what uh, Griffith was doing was he was looking at how two strains of a, a bacteria were killing mice or not killing mice. This R strain, it, it when injected into the mice, it didn't kill the mouse. Um, when the smooth strain, it literally looks rough versus smooth under a microscope. Um, whenever it was injected into a mouse, it killed the mouse. So again, Rough R strain doesn't kill the mouse. S smooth strain kills the mouse. What happened was, um, let me go back. What happened was he uh, took that S strain and he heat shocked it. So he killed the cells. And um, that would make sense that it wouldn't then kill the mouse because you're killing the cells. You're not killing the mouse. However, the interesting part was um, he took the heat killed smooth strain and mixed them with the rough strain and that mixture killed the mouse and it doesn't make sense because if we look here this doesn't kill the mouse this does this doesn't kill the mouse if we add this and this together it shouldn't kill the mouse but it does what this showed us was some agent something was going from this smooth strain into the rough strain and it was killing the mouse and that was dna and you're like wow dna codes for life and dna can maybe change a cell yeah i know that's it's a pretty like i already understand this kind of concept but this was huge news back then um Again, early 1900s, we didn't know what was the blueprint of life. We were looking at proteins. We were looking at RNA and DNA. We just didn't know what was um, the blueprint of life. Many thought it was actually proteins uh, because they have 20 amino acids and there's a lot more variability. It's like having a language out of 20 letters versus four letters. It's a lot harder to create four letter combinations of words than 20 letter combinations of words. Um, so it just we thought it was proteins and we didn't know which way it went. We didn't know if it was protein, DNA, RNA, RNA, you know, we didn't know which way it went. So we were trying to figure out which way that, that process went. Along comes Hershey and Chase, two more people. You can see there's just a lot of experiments here, but basically what they were looking at were these bacteriophages and these bacteriophages are like viruses that um, attack only bacteria. And they have two parts. They have the DNA part and they have the protein part. Now, what they did was, I'm going to kind of skip through this because I think the image is a lot better to look at and understand. They tagged the protein part with a radioactive molecule and the bacteriophage injected their DNA. We know this now, but they didn't. Uh, and the new bacteriophages weren't radioactive. So protein's not inherited. Then they tagged the DNA. The DNA was injected. The new bacteriophages all had that radioactive DNA. So DNA is inherited. So you're like, 
wait, so this experiment just shows us that DNA is being passed on, not proteins. Yes, I know this seems very simple, but again, back then that was huge news. This was really groundbreaking work. Um, but yes, proteins are not inherited from parent to offspring. It's DNA. We've been talking about that for weeks now. Um, these are just the experiments that really uh, make like or break the ground on this. All right, this is where the first part ends. You don't have to memorize any of that. It's just kind of the history so you know a little bit about it. Um, here we're going to actually start. All right, moving on <clears throat> with the history of DNA. Um, scientists knew that DNA was made of nucleotide at this time, but they didn't know what the arrangement was. So what they were trying to do is they were trying to figure out the structure of DNA. Now, Rosalind Franklin was a scientist that came around, and she was using a type of um, kind of imaging. It's when you – it's called X-ray crystallography, and it's when um, this machine – shoots a bunch of electrons at something very small, and how they reflect off of that thing shows us what that structure is. I know that's kind of really hard to comprehend, but basically this was taking photographs, and it took these photographs took a long time to develop. Um, this is photograph 51. This is our 51st attempt at the structure of DNA, and it has this X pattern. I know it might not seem like a lot to you, but this X pattern is significant. It is, um, it is evidence that the structure of DNA is in the form of a double helix. Now, she didn't know that at the time. However, um, she was working on her calculations for this. And uh, one of her colleagues actually, I'm going to put it in air quotes here, shared, um, it, there was no sharing, she, that, that Wilkins took the photo without Rosalind Franklin knowing, showed it to Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick were actually model builders. Um, and they did a quick calculation, figured out it was a double helix, made their model, and um, they they did create the first accurate model of um, DNA. But it wasn't what you know it, that wouldn't have happened unless they knew um, or that they saw this picture. So it's really Rosalind Franklin's uh, data that is significant here for the structure of DNA. Now, um, I'm not going to show you that video, but basically, um, these two gentlemen and Wilkins are uh, credited with the structure of DNA. And Rosalind Franklin was left out because she died before these uh, gentlemen got the recognition um, or the Nobel Prize in 1962. Um, it wasn't until years later, until her biography was written, that they figured out that these gentlemen had um, kind of stole that photo and, uh, you know, didn't really give her credit um, and actually really ridiculed uh, her in the book they wrote um, just there's some, you know, not great things, some injustices here that uh, we have to be aware of and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, because, you know, Franklin really was the, you know, the pinnacle or the the person who got the data for this. Um, and um, the video that I forget, I think it's the, the TED Talk there, um, does a really good job of showing how influential she was um, to the discovery of DNA. Moving forward, we're going to look at the structure of DNA um, itself. So in 12.2, we're just going to be kind of observing DNA and how it is structured. So DNA is made of nucleotides. We should remember this from our like first couple chapters on biochemistry. Um, and nucleotides have three parts. They have a phosphate group, a ring-shaped sugar molecule. This is called deoxyribose in this case. In case this is the D in DNA, deoxyribose, and OS is here as the sugar. And then they have the nitrogen-containing base. Now you can see our phosphate group our sugar, and then our base. And that nitrogenous base just means it contains nitrogen. Now, um, I like just kind of reminding you that the monomer for DNA is the nucleotides and the polymer of uh, nucleic acids is DNA. So a bunch of monomers makes up the polymer and there's four different types of nucleotides. We have adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And you can see in each one of these nucleotides, the phosphate groups are the same, the sugar molecules are the same. However, the bases are different. You can see here the bases being different. Now, adenine and guanine might look similar and cytosine and, and thymine might look similar. And that is true. We're going to see that these have two ring structures and these have single ring structures next. So just like I said, pyrimidines have a single ring nucleotide. This is cytosine and thymine. Um, uracil, I always throw in here because it's RNA, not DNA, but we'll come back to this when we talk about in, in the end of, this, end of this chapter. But pyrimidines only have a single ring. You can see here this single ring, single ring. Uh, purines, they have two rings. You can see the double rings here. Um, and a purine, if you can remember, is always going to bind with a pyrimidine. So G's and C's always bind together, and A's and T's are always going to bind together. Now, you might look at these single ring and double ring structures and say, hey, they still look very similar. And they do look similar when we look at the um, like the molecular structure, but there are differences. So you can see here, there's the nitrogen, there's an oxygen here, there's the methyl group and thymine. So they look similar. I'm going to go back. 
They look similar here just because we're showing you the outline of the nucleotide, but when you get into the molecular structure, they are different. Now, what we see within an organism or within species is the amount of A's and T's are very similar and the amount of G's and C's are very similar. You can see they're not perfect. Um, I show this in my biology classes as being perfect, but when you get down to the details, um, they're not exactly perfect, but they're very close, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But this is Chargoff's rule, and Chargoff was also influential to Watson and Crick understanding the structure of DNA, where the amounts of adenine and thymine are going to be equal, and the amounts of guanine and cytosine are going to be equal. And this is true for all species. And this should make sense because for every adenine, let me go back, for every adenine, there's going to be a thymine, and for every cytosine, there's going to be a guanine. All right, so a quick question here. Um, let me go back. Uh, you find a new type of bacteria and sequence the genome and find the percent of thymine is 21%. What's the percent of adenine? Of course, it's going to be 21%. That's easy. However, when we get to the second question, you uh, genesis sequences the genome of a lion and finds the percent of, of guanine is 34%. What's the percent of adenine? So you have to take guanine and cytosine and add them together to find the GC concentration at 68%. And then you have to find the AT concentration by subtracting this from 100, and that is 32%. So the, the remaining 32% is made of adenine and thymine. You divide that by two because they're equal amounts. Let me go back. And that's going to equal to A equals 16% and T equals 16%. So that's how you get through one of these problems. <clears throat> Lastly, we, we're going to talk about the complementary base pairing. Of course, like I said, A's and T's bond together, G's and C's bond together. Um, this is complementary base pairing in DNA. So each purine is only going to are bond specifically to a specific pyrimidine. Now, um, I'm going to kind of fly through this last part here. All right, DNA consists of two chains of nucleotides in a twisted lattice. This is that double helix. Um, the nucleotides on the outside are referred to as um, the, I'm sorry, the sugar phosphates on the outside are referred to as the sugar phosphate backbone. These are held together by covalent bonds, and covalent bonds, if you remember, are very strong. So again, we have covalent bonds here, we have covalent bonds here. So the backbone is very strong. In between the nucleotides, the bases, are hydrogen bonds. In between a and T, or the adenine and thymine, is a double hydrogen bond. Between guanine and cytosine is a triple hydrogen bond. So there's just an extra hydrogen bond between guanine and cytosine, and that is due to the structures of each nucleotide. You can see the three within, within guanine and cytosine, and the two within adenine and thymine. All right, last slide here. Anti-parallel, um, these two DNA strands run in opposite directions. You can see the one starts with the phosphate group up here while the other starts with the sugar. We label the phosphate group and the five prime and the sugar and the three primes. You can see it runs from a five to three prime direction and the other side is a three to five prime. So they run in opposite directions. This is called being anti-parallel. Um, there are also grooves within the DNA, so this is something, you know, a little bit, uh, I, don't, I don't talk to uh, my bio kids about, oh, I didn't know I could go, my screen can get a lot bigger, oh, it's so cool. Um, but what uh, what these grooves are, just you have a, a major and a minor groove, and they're just grooves within the DNA, and different proteins are going to run along these grooves. But you can see it looks, it's not just a twisted ladder, there is a groove, a, a large groove, and a small groove within this DNA structure. Again, the major and minor grooves. All right, this is where we are going to end 12.3. All right, so our next section is going to be on uh, the re replication of DNA. And uh, we're going to start by this, another uh, experiment. Um, basically, they were trying to figure out what type of replication was going on. You can see the conservative model. This is not talking about like politics or anything. This is just conservative where both ends are used and we produce a new strand of DNA, um, semi-conservative where each end is used. You can each see each one of these strands is used and then your dispersive where it's like parts of each. And we didn't know what type of um, replication was going on. Now, when we did this uh, experiment, the, uh, the scientists were using different types of nitrogen in the bases and that was uh, enabling us to uh, figure out, so there was a fly on my arm, um, figure out what type of nucleotide, the new or the old, was being found in each. Now, if it was the conservative model, you can see this strand would be the N14 and the N15. Um, during the first replication, the semi-conservative would be a little bit in the middle between N14 and N15 because, again, it's one of each of these strands. Same with the dispersive. 
So basically this is showing us, we're trying to disprove one of these models. And the first, uh, the actual observations you can see here was it was a little bit of both. So this disproves the conservative model. So then the second one would have N14 and N15, uh, 14. So like you can see here, there'd be one of each strand and then one of the one of the totally new strands. And then again, you would just have the dispersive model, which is just a mix of both. What ends up happening is it shows us that we have a semi-conservative model. And I'm going to show you another image of this. So basically what, what this shows us is um, there will always be one of the parent strand in each of these new ones. But then uh, each strand then will have one old and one new. And I know this is really kind of complicated to say like, Oh, it's semi-conservative where one is the parent, one's the new. Yes, that's the whole basis of, of this model um, or of this experiment. So DNA replication is just the uh, process of producing two identical replicas from one original DNA strand. Remember, this occurs during S phase of um, mitosis. Uh, I shouldn't really say mitosis. It, it's of the cell cycle, but it's occurring during interphase uh, because S phase is within the interphase. But um, it's, again, it's the semi semi-conservative replication. Um, each daughter strand is going to act like a template for the new strand. Now, um, this is again what D DNA replication, DNA after replication, yeah. So this is the, the identical strands of DNA here. Okay, so there's a couple of different enzymes we're gonna have to learn in this chapter. Now, um, Topioisomerase is the first. This is the enzyme that helps unwind and relaxes the twist. You can see this is topioisomerase. Um, DNA helicase, this is going to be the enzyme that unzips the parent strands of DNA. So you can see helicase moving along the DNA. Now, specifically, it's going to break the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides. It is not going to break the, the covalent bonds. Those covalent bonds are between the sugars and the phosphate, uh, uh, the sugar phosphate backbone. Helicase is not going to break those. It's breaking the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides. So these are the first two enzymes we have to know. The next two kind of vocab words we have to know are the origin of replication and replication fork. These are very similar in name, but they do have distinct meaning. So origin of replication, this is a location where replication begins. You can see the origin of replication. This is a standing point. This is, this is a stationary point. This will not move. So the origin of replication is different because the replication fork is the specific location where helicase is breaking the, those hydrogen bonds. So as this fork moves, you can see this fork moving going down the strand of DNA. The replication fork moves with helicase. Wherever helicase is, that's known as the replication fork. The origin replication is where this all starts at. So you can see in this strand of DNA, we have two replication forks. There's one here and one here because, again, it's moving with the helicase. The origin replication will not move. It's right here. My analogy is that this is the origin of replication. Where you start reading this story is the origin of replication. As you read and where you're at is the replication fork. So the origin of replication will always be here where you start the story. However, the replication fork will go along with you as you read each line. And as you can see, there are several origins of replications for DNA. You can see these little bubbles that are produced, but the replication fork is the one that moves. The origin replication will be the same place each time. Our next uh, kind of vocab words we have to know for this, this chapter are single-stranded binding proteins. We call these SSBPs. These are molecules that help DNA stay single-stranded. You can see these SSBPs in the background here. They are just like binding proteins that will help the DNA from becoming cut, damaged, or recoiling on each other, actually. Um, but these just help the DNA from becoming damaged and uh, staying just single-stranded. Primase. This is, a, is another enzyme. Again, there's a lot of enzymes in this chapter where primase is the enzyme that's going to place an RNA primer for DNA polymerase to bind with. We're going to talk about DNA per, uh, polymerase here in a second. But this RNA primer is just to really show, it's like a flag that says, hey, bind here. We need you to bind here so we can initiate uh, DNA replication. So these primers are used just as a location marker for DNA polymerase. And that brings us to DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase 3, we're going to go over actually two different types in my bio biology classes. I only really go over one type, but there are a couple different types of DNA polymerase. Um, this DNA polymerase 3, this is the enzyme that pairs free-floating nucleotides to their gomphomeric based pairs. So A's with T's, G's with C's. You can see that polymerase uh, adding the nucleotides. Now it's going to add in a five prime to three prime direction. I'm not going to show you this video, sorry. Um, you can see here it adds in a five prime to three prime direction, but it runs along the three to five prime direction. So again, it makes 
five to three, it runs along three to five. And it's very quick. It produces about a thousand base pairs per second. And um, if you think about that, that's pretty quick. I mean, thousands of base pairs of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. That's a lot of different strands uh, or, or nucleotides of DNA. Now, um, to kind of end out this, this section here, we're going to be talking about the difference between the leading and lagging strand. The leading strand, because the DNA is anti-parallel, remember that means it's going in opposite directions. Because it's anti-parallel, you're going to have two different types of um, strands. You have the lagging strand, which is this one on top, and the leading strand, which is this one on the bottom. It's not always bottom and top. It's, you know, because again, you can just flip this and look this look at it a different way. But basically the reason why the lagging strand goes away is because again, it only works in a five to three prime direction. So what happens is as this replication fork opens up new sections of DNA, you're going to create these small sections of DNA called Okazaki fragments. And again, we're only going to see these in the lagging strand, not the leading strand. The leading strand always goes towards the replication fork, so it's going to be made continuously and not um, discontinuous like we see in the lagging strand. Um, DNA polymerase 1, this is the enzyme that removes the RNA primer and adds the DNA nucleotides. So we have those primers. We can't leave those RNA primers in. We have to keep, take them out and add the nucleotides that are the correct ones. So that's the other DNA polymerase that I talk about. And then lastly, we're going to talk about ligase. This is just the enzyme here. I love this image here for ligase. Yeah, ligase just binds all the strands together. And this is only really found in the um, lagging strand because we have those Okazaki fragments. So each of these nucleotides is really important when it comes to DNA replication. And you have to know that process of how DNA replicates. Now, one more thing about DNA replication, DNA polymerase is actually really accurate. Um, it only makes an accurate between one and 100,000 and one uh, million base pairs. That's pretty accurate because remember that that DNA polymerase can work as fast as a thousand base pairs per second. Now, it all it also proofs read itself. So what happens is if it does make an error, it can fix that error and actually take out that nucleotide. Um, so it's actually not only a, um, uh, a, a producer of nucleotides, it's a proofreader as well. So it, it's pretty darn, darn accurate when it comes to uh, the DNA polymerase. Um, what it can do is you can create do this, something called uh, nucleotide excision repair. This is when another enzyme can come in here and take out a mismatched base pair and actually um, fill it in with the correct DNA sequence. This is how we prevent mutations from occurring in your cells. So again, we go from one in a million to, uh, this is reduces the error to one in a hundred million to one in a billion base pairs. And that's a really accurate thing. If you think about doing something a billion times, like, you know, there's going to be some errors. You know, if there is only one out of a billion, I mean, that's that's a pretty good that's pretty good accuracy for your replication. That should make sense because you should have the exact same DNA in each one of your cells. Now, that's not perfect, obviously, but um, it's pretty darn accurate. Here's a an example of what can happen um, where UV radiation creates these thymine thymine dimers. Um, in this case, this mutation uh, uh, just creates a um, I should say the the UV light creates a mutation within the skin. And um, certain people that have this disorder, um, I forget even how you pronounce this, they can't come in contact with the sun because it, it just is really, it becomes cancerous uh, or they, they, their likelihood of become, uh, having a cancerous uh, mutation increases. So these mutations can cause, you know, genetic disorders that really affect somebody's life. Our next section is going to focus a little bit on the central dogma of molecular biology. And um, we already talked about replication of the DNA, but this here, these three steps are basically the central dogma where DNA is going to copy itself and then it's going to copy itself in transcription to RNA, uh, specifically mRNA. And then during translation, we're going to copy mRNA and make a protein. We're not going to copy mRNA. We're going to produce a protein from this sequence. So we talked about replication. This section is going to specifically talk about transcription. And then the next section is going to specifically talk about translation. This is where the uh, RNA is read and produce, is producing a protein at the ribosome. Now within transcription, there we go, we have RNA. Remember that RNA is going to be a little bit different than DNA. DNA has deoxyribose, RNA only has ribose. Um, it also has uracil instead of thymine, so we have a new nucleotide being introduced here. So instead of a T, you have a U. And it's single-stranded instead of double-stranded. I have a little asterisk here because it's mostly single-stranded, but sometimes it can be. In this case, in this class, we always talk about it being single-stranded, really. Um, yeah. 
So again, the difference between deoxyribose and ribose, a lot of people think it's a really big difference. It's really not. It's only just an extra oxygen group here in this uh, in this OH and then the H here. So it's just one little oxygen. People think it's very different, but it's not. So remember when we go from DNA to RNA, um, we're binding instead of thymine uracil. So everything else is still the same. Thymine in DNA is going to bond with an adenine in your, an, an RNA, and the Gs and Cs are still the same. However, when you have a DNA nucleotide of adenine, it's going to pair with uracil instead. Now, our three different types of mRNA are going to be, oops, our three different types of RNA are going to be uh, messenger RNA, and this is going to be a copy of the DNA. Um, the tRNA, which is going to transfer, let me go back while wow, this is going too quick. This is going to transfer the amino acid into the ribosome. Now, this structure looks just like, you know, it kind of looks confusing. It's all RNA. It's really simplified, um, but that's, you know, the, the, the structure there. And then our last uh, type of RNA is rRNA. This is ribosomal RNA, and this makes up the ribosome. So there are three different types of RNA, and I know I went through those quickly, but um, I want to spend more time talking about transcription. All right, a little note here. I, I just actually uh, renamed this last section the central dogma. So um, I, I just thought this, this section was a little bit too long. Um, so the, the stuff that we just went over, I renamed as 12.4 central dogma. Um, I, I renamed then this one 12.5 to go over transcription. So in 12.5, now we're going to talk about transcription more specifically. Um, RNA polymerase is going to unzip DNA, and it's also going to um, make a complementary strand of RNA based on the template strand of DNA. Now, I said, I know I said a lot there. Basically, this one enzyme is going to do two jobs. It breaks apart RNA, or it breaks apart DNA, and it's going to make a copy of DNA. Now, um, the specific point at which it starts is called the promoter, um, and it's going to move into a five to three prime direction. And then again, um, the, the strand that is that is not being coded is called the coding strand. The strand that is being um, used is called the template strand. And I know it's very confusing, but look at this. So again, we are using, make sure I'm, I'm going to say this right, we are using the coding strand to make a copy. However, to do that, we have to use the uh, the template strand here. And again, this coding strand, the top one, is going to be exactly like the mRNA strand because it's made, being made in a five to three prime direction. The only difference is this strand will have uracil instead of thymine, because again, we're using the template strand. So these two strands are gonna be exactly alike. However, this one's not gonna have thymine, it's gonna have uracil. Another way of looking at it again, we go from DNA, you're using the template strand, you're making a copy of the coding strand, except it's not gonna have thymine, it's gonna have uracil. And then we're gonna use that mRNA to make a polypeptide. All right, more images, more images. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through these. All right, transcription. Um, now, DNA polymerase um, is going to stop when it meets something called the termination site. Um, so again, the promoter starts this process. The termination site is when it's just going to pop off and you're going to have your fully made mRNA. And transcription then will be complete. So the big connector between transcription and translation is this mRNA molecule. All right, that ends 12.5 transcript. All right, our last section is going to be on 12.6, which is translation. Um, just to get a little bit uh, more in depth with this nu nucleotide sequence, a codon is co or a codon is a triplet code of nucleotides. You can see three nucleotides codon one, three nucleotides codon two, and so on and so forth. Now, two terms that we got to know here is are, are degenerate, where several amino acids have more than one codon. So we're going to see that from a codon chart, you're going to see several amino acids can, can all be coded for by more than one codon. This is also unambiguous, which means each codon only has one meaning. So AUG only has one meaning. However, methionine and other amino acids might have several codons that code for it. You'll see, th this is tough to understand just now, but you'll understand what I'm talking about when we see our codon chart. Here we go, codon chart. So again, each nucleotide codon, there's these one, two, three, only has one specific uh, amino acid, which means UCU will only bind or only produce serine. However, serine has several codons, so like UCU, UCC, UCA, UCG, they all code for serine. So again, each codon only makes one amino acid, but each amino acid might have several codons that code for it. Now, I like using this chart. However, this chart's also <clears throat> also good. You can see the first, second, and third base, uh, and you can tell you what it actually is. 
So translation again, now I just explained how you use these charts. Now I'm not, I'll do this in class a little bit more in depth, but basically you start here on the inner because we're going from five to three prime direction. So GCU, you can see GCU codes for alanine. That's how you read one of these charts. Now there are 20 different amino acids that make up proteins. You can see these amino acids. I'll give you one of these amino acid charts here shortly um, uh, in class, but you can see the 20 different amino acid names. There are three letter abbreviation and then there are one letter abbreviation. Yes, they have both. And in college, you have to memorize them. I don't know if they still make you memorize them. I remember I had to memorize them, but um, yeah, basically that the, the codon sequence is important because it's going to code for the uh, protein. Now, a couple different, ooh, let me go back, a couple different uh, really important codons are our start and stop codons, where our start codon is going to be AUG, and we have three stop codons, UAA, UAG, and UGA. They all code for the stop codon, which stops the ribosome from producing that protein. However, all proteins will start with that AUG because that's just our start codon. Um, once the mRNA is produced, it's going to leave the nucleus, it's going to find a ribosome, and uh, that tRNA molecule is going to move uh, the amino acid into the ribosome. We talked about tRNA just a little bit ago, but you can see that amino acid being brought in by this tRNA molecule. So that tRNA is going to bind with the codon sequence, and that tRNA molecule is going to look like a clover leaf, and it's going to contain something called the anticodon. The anticodon is going to be complementary to the codon. So if we have CUU, it's going to be GAA. It's going to be complementary here of the base pairing. Um, and each tRNA is only going to have one amino acid, and that amino acid is going to be um, kind of congruent uh, to the anticodon there. So the, the amino acid is congruent to the codon, but it's also congruent to the anticodon. So you can see what that tRNA molecule actually looks like. We show it almost just like a clover leaf, but it looks like this tRNA sequence. Oh, it's like, like a jumbled mess, but this is what the tRNA looks like. Now I like showing this um, animation. It shows you the process of um, what, uh, what translation looks like. So you can see the ribosome attaching to the mRNA. It reading the mRNA. I'm going to go back and then forward again. Hopefully it plays. There we go. And as these, uh, as the ribosome continues down, it's going to add in more amino acids based on the mRNA sequence. And then once it uh, hits that stop codon, you can see here, it's going to pop off and that ribosome is going to stop translating. Our last part of 12.6 is going to talk about um, just like protein synthesis a little bit more. Before we get there, we have to talk about the wobble hypothesis. This is the hypothesis states that the first two nucleotides are important to the anticodon base pairing, but not the last nucleotide. And this will make sense if you look at this chart. So what happens here is the first two nucleotides, like UC, that's really important. But it really doesn't matter what that last nucleotide is, because all four are going to code for serine. Uh, C U U. They all code for the same leucine. However, there there will be some that codes for like a difference between the histidine and uh, glutamic or no, that's glutamine here. Um, some of them are specific, but some of them really aren't, and that's because there's a dissociation between the last you can see here that last nucleotide where it, there's a wobble position. It doesn't need to bind. Um, because it's really only really important for the first two nucleotides to bind. Um, and this is a hypothesis states that it doesn't really need to be specific. Um, it just needs to be the first two uh, specific uh, to binding. Now the ribosome, let's talk about the ribosome a little bit more in depth. The ribosome is going to be made of two subunits, a large and small. Um, it's made of RNA, like we talked about in the beginning in proteins and um, RNA in orange. And I think I have to delete that. It doesn't pertain to this image, but um, Oh, yeah, it does. Here we go. So you can see the ribosomal part, the RNA is in orange, the protein is in blue. So you can see what that looks like. And it's a mix of the two. Now, our ribosome also has three different parts as the A site, the P site, and the E site. The A site is where the tRNA enters. The P site is where the peptide bonds to the previous amino, uh, amino acid sequence. So you can see the amino acids binding together. And the E site is where the tRNA exits. Now, this tRNA will go and find a new amino acid to bring into the, uh, the ribosome uh, for translation. Now, I absolutely love this animation. It's in German. I cannot find this in uh, English. So if you find it in English, please let me know because I absolutely love it. But you can see the ribosome binding to the AUG site. That's the start, uh, the start site. The ribosome is going to 
run along the mRNA sequence here. You can see the amino acids binding together. And then the ribosome is going to hit the stop codon. And that stop codon will initiate the ribosome to unattach. And then you have your polypeptide. Now that polypeptide will go and uh, become a protein. It's not a protein just yet, but that is what translation looks like. Just a couple of reminders, proteins are, um, we, we talked about this a little bit in chapter like two or three, I think it was three, um, but proteins are the sequence of amino acids and their structure is dependent on that sequence of amino acids. Um, and we, we talked about this ton before, but structure determines function and uh, how those amino acids bind together is going to uh, determine its structure. Um, we talked about this a lot when we talked about biochemistry, um, but just a good reminder. And I'm going to end here with this, this uh, talking about a gene. A gene is a portion of DNA that determines uh, or influences a trait, um, determines the sequence of amino acids. So again, we find our chromosome. It's going to have a gene. That gene is going to code for a protein, and those proteins make us uh, who we are and give us our features. So this should be the end. I'm going to kind of show this video, but this, yep, this is the end of chapter 12.